You're listening to The Intellectual Investor, episode number 117, Tesla, Ice Cold Killer, interview with Michael Covell. To learn more about Vitaly's investing firm, IMA, go to imausa.com. Tesla, Ice Cold Killer, interview with Michael Covell. Dear listener, in this podcast, I was lucky enough to chat with Michael Covell about all things Tesla. Getting into the weeds, we discuss Tesla's profitability, or lack thereof, the nuances of the charging network and the engine, as well as prospects for ICE car makers to make the jump from gasoline to electric. Enjoy. This is Trend Following Radio where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. A return guest today, Vitaly Katzen-Nelson. Value guy, value investor, a guy with a contrarian edge. He's got a new book out, dives into a topic that it seems like the whole world is in love with right now. I've never driven one. This would be the Tesla, the Tesla from Mr. Elon Musk. So today it's the deep dive into the Tesla. Vitaly's the owner of one, so he's got a little bit of experience to share with us all. The big question becomes, will every car company in the world disappear and will Elon Musk own it all? I'm a trend following guy, so I got no freaking clue. But right now, the trend, the trend says, yes, Musk will own it all. Without any further delay, let's jump right into a little bit of a chat with Vitaly Katzen Nelson about Elon Musk and Tesla. You know, if you would have polled retail America, small businesses, malls, et cetera, even the Walmarts and the Costco's, 15 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, maybe even less, if you would have said one company is going to come along and dominate you all and put you all potentially out of business, small business, retail, malls, Amazon, you would have said, there's no way this is going to happen. So as I'm thinking about our conversation today, in the last year, I have watched a significant number of Jay Leno garage episodes, whatever he calls it, Jay Leno's garage. And I have to say, I've gotten a real education on the auto industry that I never had before. Because you you listen to 10 or 15 episodes of Jay Leno and all of his cars going back to the early 1900s. I mean, steam, electric, the motors we have now. Boom, you just get this amazing, so many different car companies, so much competition, so much iteration. And then here I get to you today. So I get the setup with Amazon. I'm saying, God, I could never imagine all of these things going to one company. And I look at Jay Leno's garage and I say, well, gosh, I could never imagine all of the car companies just giving it up and saying to one car company, you can be the master. But is that what's happening right now with Tesla? Where is the competition? I'm kind of missing the boat here. Why are so many people excited only about Tesla to the exclusion of the entire auto industry? What have I missed? Have I been asleep? It's almost like everybody was making dumb phones and now they start to make Blackberries. And then you have this company that's making iPhones. For a while, they keep buying Blackberries because they were buying Blackberries. Blackberry is still doing fine until it just dissipates. This analogy is not perfect. What happens is that the companies learn the lessons. This history was not just wasted on them. In a sense, they understand that they can become Blackberries or Nokias. And I think they're trying very hard But what makes it very, very difficult is that the cash flows are still coming from making internal combustion engine cars. That's where the cash flow is coming from. The expertise from making internal combustion engine cars are partially useful and partially they're actually detrimental. Because in a normal car, you have 5,000 moving parts. Well, 
the electric car has, I don't know, a few dozen moving parts. Therefore, all these engineers that spend their careers designing this 5,000 moving parts that they don't need anymore, that's actually now becoming your liability. Again, I see cars, that is mostly hardware, very little software. Or at least if there is software, it's very little it is a consumer-facing software. Where if you look at the electric car or look at Tesla, there is the, the mix between hardware and software is very different. These companies are trying extremely hard. They have to almost de-learn what they've learned in the past to be innovative in this industry. They learn from Steve Ballmer's comments about, remember Steve Ballmer said about Apple, oh, $700 device, who wants to buy this? Something like this. Remember this when he talked about iPhone? Steve Ballmer, I'm sure very embarrassed about those comments. General Motors and Ford, et cetera. I think they understand what's happening and I think they're trying extremely hard. It is very, very difficult. Yeah, as I say, when I watch 10, 15, 20 episodes of Jay Leno's Garage, different types of engines, this goes back in time. So I get it that they've, built up this entire infrastructure in internal combustion. But my God, it seems like they're flat-footed. Give the audience some perspective. I know you know the numbers off the top of your head. Give the audience some perspective on the Tesla share price move in the last one year. 10x went up eight or 10 times or something from where it was a year, like eight months ago. It's insane. When I was writing about Tesla, I kept going back to this quote by F. Scott Fitzgerald. This quote should be in the top of your mind when we have this conversation. The test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time. When you talk about Tesla, you have to understand is that, yes, this is an incredible car. And I believe right now I own two cars. We just bought a Model Y for my wife, two Teslas. But at the same time, that company has a market capitalization of $650 billion, something like that bigger than the whole outer industry combined. The market is assuming that they will succeed and everybody else will fail. There's no evidence of that in the car industry since the inception. But that's why, in the beginning of my opening question, that's why I gave the Amazon connection because it's like, maybe we are in another one of these situations like Amazon where everybody is so flat-footed and such a wrong model. And if you have mass adoption, maybe there is a chance where all these other car companies become extinct? I mean, I guess that's an option. I mean, again, when you go through the car industry history, you can see so many brands and models have just gone by the way of the dinosaur. I think Warren Buffett had this insight. It was a given. It was a given that the cars will replace horses. I'm going to butcher that quote, but it was something along the lines that was given that cars will replace horses, but it, you still would have lost a lot of money betting on which company will succeed. This is where it gets very complicated because if you remember 1999, Qualcomm stock went up from $4 to 80 If I remember, Qualcomm basically said, we're going to stop making handsets and we're just going to focus on developing chips, licensing our technology. That was it. Stock went up 20x in one year. If you think about Qualcomm was positioned perfectly to be in front of this mobile revolution because... Every time you buy a cell phone, Qualcomm makes money, no matter where you are globally. You buy, next time you buy an iPhone, $7 or $15, whatever that is, gets deposited in the Qualcomm's checking account. That company is positioned perfectly to benefit from explosion of mobile phones. However, Qualcomm sales went over that time period from 1999 or 2000 to 2015 went up 5x. That's impressive. That's a very nice growth over 15 years, 5X. So people were right that there is a huge amount of growth ahead of the company. However, at first, the stock declined 80%. In 2000, it collapsed 80%. If you bought it in 1999, it took 15 years for you to come back to 99 highs. The point I'm trying to make, you can have a great company, but the price you pay does matter. If you look at Tesla's valuation today, they can, another analogy I use from Star Trek. In Star Trek, whenever the spaceship tries to go from one quadrant to another, they would go through wormholes, which basically kind of fold space. So you can travel billions of miles in a matter of seconds, something like that. Well, if you look at the valuation of Tesla today, it basically discounts if there is a temporal wormhole. If Tesla already produced Last year, produced, I don't know, 50, uh, 500 million car, 500,000 cars, roughly. Price today is if it's already producing 
20 million cars today. It's already happened, even though it would take, first of all, time, and second of all, it would take tens and maybe hundreds of billions of dollars of capital. The market is somewhat ignoring that today. You as a value guy, what you want to make the case, I'm going to let you take the example of like stepping into a Tesla for the first time, but you as a value guy, you're really saying is on one side, from your perspective, you have the technology, which to you, I think you're going to make the case to you seems inevitable. But then on the other side, as a value guy, you're saying this might not be the play at the current moment. That's exactly right. Yes. Another point I would make is this. When I wrote this little book, Tesla Nanya on Tesla, one point I made there, the price was much lower, that the Tesla is a path-dependent company. To me, it's a very interesting intellectual concept too. Path-dependent company means that the company's success is, depends on success of its stock price or success of events that it can control. The point I was trying to make at the time is that Tesla was losing a lot of money. It had a lot of debt. And this is let's like going back one and a half, two years ago. It had a lot of debt. If something happens and the bond market frees up and it can borrow money or it has problems with productions or whatever, it can go bankrupt. Not could go bankrupt in the sense that they're going to stop making cars, but if you're a shareholder, you get wiped out and somebody else comes in and owns the shares. But what has happened over the last eight months, the other path has developed, that because the stock price is so high, Tesla was able to issue a lot of shares. It actually didn't have to issue that many shares, but valuation was so high, it could raise money that now you don't have to worry about Tesla going bankrupt. And by the way, you think that may sound ridiculous. Well, when Elon Musk admitted twice that in 2008, Tesla almost went bankrupt, when they were trying to ramp up production Model 3, they almost went bankrupt as well. I didn't have to have much imagination even a year and a half ago. I'll give you this scenario. People perceive that company has problems, stock price declines, suppliers say, instead of paying in 60 days, you're going to pay me in 30. That in itself kind of becomes self-fulfilling prophecy and company goes bankrupt. Well, today that's less likely to happen because they were able to take advantage of a high stock price and issue shares so they have much better balance sheet, even though the profitability is still very questionable. Okay, so let's go back and do a walkthrough. I'm going to let you be the sales guy because I've not been in a Tesla. I'm going to guess that the vast majority of Americans that have a car have never been in a Tesla. Is that a fair assessment probably? Probably have a guesstimate, maybe two or three million cars in a row today. Probably, yeah. Yeah, so the vast majority of people have not probably experienced the Tesla experience. You do a great job of describing the experience in your book, but give me the walkthrough. What's the whole process? Like you're sitting in your house, you're reading the paper, you're having coffee, it's cold outside, you are now getting ready to go get in the car. Explain the Tesla experience from that moment. There was a Tesla app on my iPhone. I go to this app and I turn on the heat. If it's cold outside, when I get into the car, even if it's parked in my garage, I can turn on the heat, you know, in this case, from my phone. The phone is in my pocket. I just open the door, push a lever to start driving. A couple of things. First of all, there is no start ignition. I did not have to do anything to open the door because what happens, because I have a Tesla app on my phone, through Bluetooth, it unlocks the door. I just push the handle, open the door. When I get into the car, again, because I've been authenticated, I just start driving. There is no sound. It's completely quiet. That in itself is a very unique experience. To make things more interesting, there is a big screen that's the size of, I don't know, like 17 or 20 inch monitor. It shows me my appointments because it's connected to my calendar. It also recognizes that I'm probably driving to work because that's what I'm doing. It starts telling me how much time it would take for me to get to work. But then this is the part I still love the most. I, and I had this car for more than a year and a half. Every single time I push gas, which is not even gas because it's, there's no gasoline, but I push that gas pedal, what traditionally we'd call gas pedal, the car just flies. It's very difficult to explain to somebody who hasn't driven it. It's almost trying to explain a rainbow to a blind man a little bit. You don't understand this until you've driven a car, but when you drive a CE car, there is a delay, a microsecond delay between you push your gas and the car goes. That delay does not exist in an electric car. That car is so quick. It's not fast, it's quick. That makes the driving experience so much 
more pleasurable. Let's clarify this. I am a geek. You said you're a geek? Really? Come on. I would never guess that all my fund manager, money guys, and nerds are all geeks. I would never guess such a thing. I'm being facetious. I am not a car geek. The point I'm trying to stress, I never cared about cars. Now it's a tech issue. Now that it's in your realm, it's tech now. Yeah, exactly. If you ask me how many horsepowers my previous car had, I would not be able to tell you that. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. I was never a car geek at all. Yeah, I cared more about Bluetooth and be able to listen music in a car than, yeah. The point I'm trying to stress is that this love affair with Tesla I'm describing, this is not coming from a car guy. This is just a, from a kind of an average consumer. Other car companies, we start this conversation off with some mention of it. Are there any car companies right now that have any model, electric model, as you say, EV, are there any other car companies with EVs that compete with any Tesla vehicles at this moment in time? This is where my knowledge thins out very quickly. But from what I understand is that Tesla Model S, the first mass production car they made, the first one was Roadster. I'm kind of ignoring that. The first mass production car they made, sedan, is still probably better than almost any car made, than most cars made by the big five. It doesn't mean that the other guys will not catch up with them. But the point I'm trying to stress is that there is an assumption in the market that these other guys will be able to successfully compete with Tesla. The point I want to stress, this assumption, that may be true, that may happen, but it's not a given because it's a lot more difficult than people think that is. Because we talked about before, we're basically going from one domain to another. The intellectual problem is this. When you look at Tesla car or you look at internal combustion engine sedan or whatever, they look identical from the outside. But the problem is the inside, they're very different. Your assets, when you go from ICE, internal combustion engine domain to electric cars domain, your assets become your liabilities. This is why the other car companies are still struggling. The answer is though, since you're a pretty detailed guy and you've read in the book, I'm guessing that at this moment in time, there really isn't a consumer market EV from another car company that the potential new Tesla buyer for the first time doesn't really have the ability to look around and go, oh, okay, you know, I'm looking at the Tesla and I'm looking at Mercedes-Benz comparable model. That doesn't really exist at this moment in time. From their perspective, there's absolutely not. No, absolutely. From their perspective, no. That's amazing, actually, if you think about it. Tesla is this far into the game for the first time Tesla buyer. There's not an option to compare. That's kind of amazing. Given the size of the car industry going back, what, 120 years, that's quite amazing. This is a very important point to understand. They're both cars, but to some degree, it's almost like comparing courses to cars. Going through the history of watching Jay Leno explain automobiles going back over time and the different types of engines, I mean, yes, electric vehicles were a very, very small market back in the early 1900s, but car companies seem to have had this mental flexibility and now they don't. There are aspects of a car that are going to translate regardless of engine type, suspension and all kinds of things, design. I mean, some beautiful designs of cars, but it's just quite amazing that we're looking at a situation at this point in time in history. And I guess, again, this is, I bring up the Amazon thing at the top. It's like, okay, Jeff caught an entire industry flat-footed. He saw it and I don't know, is it is a good contrast to Tesla? I mean, how long of a runway does Tesla have before BMW, Mercedes, Ford, Chevy, et cetera, do something where the average consumer can do comparison shopping? How long of a runway does Musk have until someone competes with him? This work is difficult, right? Because Tesla is also improving all the time as well. But this is also translates to why the share price is taken off. I agree with you 100%. That's why the stock price went up as much as it has. It's probably went up too fast, but that's, you know, should it be up 200% instead of being 800%? Who knows? Tesla has other advantages that we haven't discussed yet. Number one advantage, it has this huge network of superchargers. And let me explain you this point. My Model 3 battery has a range about 300 miles. The way you want to think about this, when I charge my car at home, it charges about 40, 45 miles an hour. So it takes me, I don't know, six or seven hours, if I was at zero, whatever that number is, seven hours to charge the whole car. When I'm driving from Denver to Santa Fe, which I've done, which is about 400-mile drive, 
won't be able to get there. So I would have to stop by a supercharger. Superchargers on the parking lot next to Subway or a gas station. Actually, a lot of times it's next to other gas stations, just gas stations. You bring your car there, you plug it in. There it charges at about 150 to 100 miles per hour. So much faster. Tesla has the network. I forget the number of units, but they have a network across the country and across Europe. And I think now they're going into Asia as well. That is significant competitive advantage. It's not a unsurmountable in the sense that it doesn't prevent other companies of doing it. It's just today, let's say, even if there was a comparable car, even if GM had a car that was comparable to Tesla, Tesla had that going for them. There's another factor. I think this may be changing actually. In 1920s, there was a law passed that car companies cannot own the dealerships. General Motors makes cars and they have franchisees across the world, which basically are selling their cars. General Motors has very little control over that process. Tesla took a different route. They basically took kind of the Apple route where they have stores most of the time inside of shopping malls. A lot of times right across the hallway from Apple store what they have in Denver. You go to the store, you look at the car. If you want to test drive it, you go outside. They have a maybe a dozen of Teslas parked in the parking lot. You go for a test drive. If you decided to buy the car, and this was my experience, I literally just went online, put a $100 deposit, filled out my information. I did it two weeks ago with my wife's car. Filled out information, which probably took me, I don't know, three minutes or two minutes, or very little time. I set an appointment to pick up the car in three days. When I came to pick up the car, I went to a different place now, this huge service center, less expensive neighborhood than they have their stores because they have much bigger footprint there. Almost looks like a dealership to some degree. But I literally walked in, I signed two pieces of paper, sat in the car and drove away. That process could have been taken maybe five minutes at the most. But here's the interesting part, going back to General Motors. They are extremely profitable for dealers because they have monopolies. If I remember right, about half of the money on selling, maybe one third of the money on selling new cars, maybe one third of the money on making used cars, and maybe these numbers are a little bit off. Also, another third of the money on servicing cars. Well, with Tesla, the car requires very little servicing. In other words, the brakes last, I think, up to 100,000 miles. And the reason brakes last this long because you don't use brakes in a traditional way. It has regenerative braking, so when I stop pushing the gas pedal, the car starts braking automatically, not by pushing brakes, but basically by motor. Software design as well, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But what happens, basically, motor, instead of consuming electricity, it starts generating electricity. And that process actually recharges batteries, but it also stops the car. So, therefore, I use brakes a lot less than you would normally use. And therefore, brakes last for our purpose forever. There is no oil change. And there are fewer moving parts, so there are fewer things to break. It gets even more interesting. Whenever you have a problem, with my Model 3, in the beginning, I had a problem with my microphone. You go into Tesla app, you say service, and you describe the problem. Then you schedule an appointment. And then they give you options. You can go to the service center and bring the car there. or they'll come to you. I didn't want to go to service center, so I gave my work address. A guy showed up because I described the problem that I had. He brought the parts they thought they may need. You're such a fanboy now, aren't you? You are completely sold. You're selling me. You're probably selling the audience. Musk needs to send you some commission, huh? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm a big fanboy. It's more than that. What sets Tesla apart, this is what I give Musk incredible credit. Sometimes ignorance is a bliss. Let me explain what I mean by this. Musk was able to build a company on a first principles perspective. In other words, if you knew nothing about how to make a car and you were going to build an electric car, how would you make it? Think about it, your four-wheel drive car, the gasoline car. You have an engine sitting up front, which is huge, and then you have a transmission, and then you have all these gears and stuff carrying the power to back wheels. That's how you make a four-wheel drive car. Now, if you know this and you were going to make an electric car that's four-wheel drive, go, okay, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to have a motor up front, and then I'm going to have all these gears carry the power to my back wheels. That's not what Musk did. That's not what Tesla did. What they did, because the size of electric motor is really just the size of watermelon. It's relatively small. They just literally put a motor on the front wheels and back wheels. 
that's how they created four wheel drive car. What's interesting, your gas consumption of a normal car, if it's four wheel drive, it usually consumes more gas. The electricity consumption of a four wheel drive electric car is actually less. And the reason for that, because when you are in the electricity regeneration mode, in other words, when you're braking or you're going downhill, now two motors generating electricity. It's not just for as a consumer, but intellectually, the car is created so brilliantly. Let me go back to an example that you brought up because I want to know because I think you do know. You brought up the example of driving a 400-mile drive. I think it was from Denver to Santa Fe. And you talked about a 300-mile battery life. So obviously, there's going to be a recharging needed there. Take my example I'm going to give you right now. A long time ago, back in the day, I did a spring break bartending. I must have been like 21 or something. A spring break bartending at South Padre Island, Texas, down near Mexico. And when I left, I was going to grad school at Florida State. So I drove around the Gulf Coast. I don't know, I left like 6 a.m. and I drove 17 and a half hours by myself. I was driving a VW Golf. I stopped four times, maybe for five minutes each, simply to get gas and, and take a leak. That was it. So 17 and a half hours and a grand total of 20 minute stops, four times to get gas. Contrast that with the current technology of Tesla. I'm driving 17 and a half hours with a gas car. I can stop four times, five minutes each to fill up the tank and keep rolling. What am I having to do at this moment in time with Tesla to contrast against that trip? What am I losing with Tesla in terms of the weight to get recharged? You're going to have to stop every 200, 250 miles roughly. For how long? This answer is going to depend on a couple of things. If you pull up a station, multiple charging stations, if you pull up and you're the only car charging, you probably get in like 300 miles an hour, some very large number. You'd have to wait an hour to get 300 more miles to drive. Yes. Well, it gets a little bit slightly more complicated. There are nuances. The first 80 or 90, 85 or 90 percent of the charge will go incredibly fast. The last 10 percent will go incredibly slow. The reason for that, because the last 10 percent, this is where the battery starts to overheat, and this is why they slow down the charge. I usually charge up to 90 percent, unless I know that where I'm driving, I'm going to be pushing, I need the last 10 percent. But in reality, if you're driving on major highways, if you're going from Denver to Santa Fe and you're just sticking on I-25, because there's more one way to get to Santa Fe, but if you just go on I-25, I think they have a charging station every 100 to 150 miles. I don't need to get a 100% charge. You said you could get a 300-mile charge on one hour. Is that what you're saying? In my example that I gave you, the tank was getting me about 300 miles on each fill-up. Essentially, for my little journey, my little crazy story, at this current moment in time with Tesla, it would take about four hours longer because I would have to do the charging. That's essentially what the difference is at this moment in time. Your caveat at this point in time is extremely important because it's not quite following the Moore's law. It's improving tremendously. I'll give an example. And I think this number is going to be about right. The cost of the battery in the Model S when they started to make it was about $30,000. The cost of the battery in the Model 3, my car, I think it's about $12,000. The battery technology is improving tremendously because there is so much focus on this. Tesla is going to make the Cybertruck futuristic looking SUV. And I think that one has a, either 500 or 600 miles. Say it's a 600 mile range. Going six miles, you know, that you're going for you to get, you know, you basically have to be driving like for nine or 10 hours before you have to pull up to one of those charging stations. At that point, you probably want to have a break. But also, there is a couple caveats. My kids and I drive to Santa Fe once, twice a year. When we took my Tesla, the first time we stopped by, got pizza, eating pizza in the car while the car was charging. Another time, we just stopped by in a restaurant, the car was charging, and we were eating while the car was charging. Do you really have to map out, though, where these charging stations are? Because, I mean, obviously, with gas stations, if you're going on highways among different states, you can kind of figure things out. You always know there's going to be a fail-safe somewhere. Has the Tesla charging stations got to the point where you can have that same sense as a young guy driving your car on the highways that you can always kind of get a fill-up? Have you got that same sense with the Tesla, or do you have to think about it more? Not at all. It is so much better than that. All these stations are built into the mapping app. When you get into the car and you put your destination, it tells you where you need to charge. It's actually better than that because when you hit on that, in fact, when you set your destination and you say, I'm going to charge there, 
five or ten minutes before you approach the station, the car starts going into a special mode that prepares the battery. There is a name for that. That prepares the battery for charging. The charging anxiety, I think that's what stops a lot of people today, does not exist. Get where you're coming from because I had the same anxiety. But I tell you this, I haven't been to a gas station in a year and a half, like normal gas station. I cannot tell you how much I don't miss them. Right now, what happens when I get home, park my car in the garage, power cable, connect it to my car, and that's it. I don't have to think about it. Instead of you spending whatever, five or 10 minutes every time you put gas in your car, I maybe spend three or four hours more. But during the year, when you're just normally going back to work or whatever, the amount of time you save on not going to gas station is actually makes up for that. Elon Musk is smart, obviously. He is not designing a car industry based on a crazy guy like me driving 17 and a half hours by himself. That's the number one person you're not designing a car for. The vast majority of people, it's just like when you use your iPhone. I mean, the reality is most of us are not away from our chargers that long. We've all learned that lesson with an iPhone. This is very interesting. I remember this vividly. When iPhone came out, the bears were saying, my Motorola phone or Nokia phone can last for, I don't know, a week or two weeks. This thing barely lasts a day. Except the iPhone was not a phone. It was your laptop now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Here's the thing. Because the phone was in its name, if you looked at iPhone as a phone, you put yourself in the domain. It was not in the phone domain. It was in the computer domain. Switching yourself. I don't know, but you probably need to come up with a different name for an electric car than just a car. I need to be more creative with that. It's a very different domain. I accept imperfection of today's car, of electric car. I'm going to spend more time at the charging station when I go long distance, and I'm willing to make the sacrifice for all other advantages. I'll give you a few more advantages. It has an autopilot. It does a great job, and I got to be extremely specific and careful because I think it's a great tool, but it can also cost lives as well. But if you are driving on a very well-lit road, on the highway with very good dividers, you have to pay very little attention to the road. I can be talking on the phone, I can be texting, it doesn't matter because the autopilot is going to keep me in the lane and is going to keep the distance between me and the other car. That makes the trip so much more pleasurable and so less stressful. Another factor here, which again, I've not driven a Tesla, but another factor is, is it's constantly monitoring the other traffic. Yes, it keeps you in the lane before people put me into this person who basically kind of into bull camp. Let me just give you the other side of that. I think Tesla has been irresponsible promoting that feature. They tell you to keep your hands on the wheel when you do this, but then Elon Musk goes to on ABC or NBC and does an interview. He basically not keeping his hands on the wheel. People think that it's safe and foolproof. Well, it's a feature that's not ready for prime time if you're driving in the city. A few times, I almost got into car accidents when there was a construction. There was no median. This could have cost me my life. There was no median. It's basically confused where I was staying with incoming traffic. So it almost took me into incoming traffic. Hey, man, that's the cost for being a Tesla fanboy. Some of you guys are not going to make it. I mean, that's just the reality. <laughs> <That's true>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Damn, no, I so, love so, this car, that head-on traffic and the autopilot. That's the cost. <laughs> that feature works perfectly in a very discreet situation when you're driving on the highway that has a divider, that has no construction, etc. which is probably 95% of the time when you're driving on long distance. I can think of doing the drive from San Diego to Las Vegas many, many times, and I can't imagine on that drive, construction everywhere, up the mountains, up that pass you do, and oh my God, man, autopilot would scare the hell out of me for that journey. I don't know. That's the point I'm trying to stress. In that case, you don't use it. Let's talk about autopilot. Self-driving potentially will become a significant competitive advantage for Tesla. There are five levels of self-driving. And I don't know all the levels, but level five is basically when you get into the car and say, take me to work, and it just takes you there. That's level five. And then you have four other levels, less advanced every time as you go down. Elon Musk is basically saying, oh, we are level five ready. A couple of years ago, he said, we're going to have robot taxis in 2020 or 2021, I forget when. And obviously, we're not there. But what's important about Tesla, that Google, Tesla has a lot more data, a lot more 
real miles driven data on that than Google does because Google has a lot of simulated data. Does Google have EVs as well? Yeah, what Google is trying to do, they're not trying to make a car. So they would take Toyota. Then they, Google works on hardware. Google does not care about making a car. They care about making a self-driving. They would take Toyota SUV, and then they work on the self-driving, put hardware on top of that. No more SUV, just from a dealership. Put their own hardware on top of it. And then they work on software to create self-driving. I don't know how many cars Google has, but it's basically, I know, maybe hundreds of thousands of cars going around the country and learning. It's all about learning. They're learning the process information, making adjustments. Tesla has millions of cars constantly collect data and send it to the Mars ship. For the level five self-driving to work, if I remember right, it has to work 99 point, take out five nines after the comma. 99% is easy to do. With every nine that's to the right of it, that gets more and more complicated. My thinking about this, and let me give you this framework to think about it. People go to school as a doctors to read x-rays. Radiologists read x-rays. Average radiologist reads about 100 x-rays a day. So you read the x-ray and then you try to identify if there's a tumor or whatever, and you know that x-ray could be taken in Denver and there's a radiologist sitting in Chicago, whatever, in the basement reading it. And then he tells you there is a tumor here. He knows it. If you think about it, that's probably one of the first jobs to be replaced by AI because computer can do the two. Every time a radiologist reads it, he, he notates. And if computer goes through 100,000 x-rays that have been read previously by a radiologist, computer will be able to see a pattern. If you have this and this, that means there is a tumor. But the problem is, if you go to a doctor, it's not a just broken bone or something, but something more serious than that, you probably still want the x-ray to be read by human because you don't quite trust the computer. Not yet. And this is where the AI is going first. What's going to happen, and I think it's already happening, the AI is assisting radiologist. When the x-ray is you know, brought up, AI reads it first and tells radiologist, take a look at these areas. There may be concern. It's almost like assisted self-driving autopilot for Tesla. It says, take a look at this area. That's number one. Number two, after radiologist read the x-ray, there was absolutely no reason why AI, about 5 or 10% of x-rays are peer-reviewed by somebody else. Out of 100 x-rays, maybe 5 or 10, maybe less, are looked at by other radiologists to catch errors. Well, there's absolutely no reason why you cannot have 100% of all x-rays reviewed by a computer as well. You can see how this AI has a secondary role. Human taking the full responsibility for it, but computer is making human more efficient. It's giving you more information, more data, more potential to catch error, et cetera. We probably not gonna see self-driving for a long time, really. But I think this is where we're going. I think the computer will be there to prevent accidents. It kind of does this already. My car, when I'm driving, suddenly it feels like I'm a like car is going straight, but the road is coming to the right. My car starts going crazy and says, take over. Even if it's not self-driving, if it's just, if it's normal, it's actually start to steer me into the lane. If I'm driving and, you know, let's say I'm texting, which never happens, it feels like I'm about to ram into another car, it's actually going to push brakes. So it has these safety features already. This is where we're going. This is where we're going. Before we get to full cell driving, I think this is the safety features that's going to save a lot of lives. You have gone down the path. I give you credit. You definitely inspire me and intrigue me. I can't imagine for the life of me in the city that I'm currently in that any kind of self-driving will take place <laughs> in the next 25 years because it's absolutely chaos. But people have to go check out your work. You've got a new book out that you go into a lot more detail than we've done in this conversation, a lot more issues. The book, Tesla, Elon Musk, and the EV revolution, in-depth analysis of what's in store for the company, the man, and the industry by a value investor and newly minted Tesla owner. That is officially the longest title I've ever read on this podcast in eight <laughs> years. You now win. You have now SEO'd the Tesla Musk thing for Amazon. So you will now, you will now win. <laughs> for your listeners, if you don't want to buy the book, which is fine, actually, go to teslaanalysis.com. Literally just get the whole book, I think in 10 parts by email. So you don't even have to buy the book. Just go to teslaanalysis.com. Put in your first name, email, and the best part, 
this is probably not the last thing I've written about Tesla. You get those updates as well. As I write more about Tesla or other things, you get those updates as well. I don't drive, frankly. I have not been a regular driver for eight years or so living in a big city and whatnot. And when I'm going and traveling and whatnot, I'm usually, someone's usually driving me. I care less and less about it, which is an entirely different conversation to see if in the future that more people will be like me, or am I just the outlier that I just don't care about the car stuff as much anymore. It's not relevant to me. Almost like most millennials now. Yeah, yeah. I basically going back and I'm Benjamin Button in Saigon, man. I'm going backwards. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's hey, right. listen, repeat that link one more time where people can go check out the, uh, the book. TeslaAnalysis.com. Okay, cool. Hey, thanks for coming on. Keep me posted on the next bit of insight. I thoroughly enjoy getting a little bit of a Tesla education because I really had none. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you. Thank you for listening. This and other investment articles by Vitaly Katzenelson are based on value investing principles that were first brought down from the mountain by Benjamin Graham and later were popularized by Warren Buffett. To learn more about these principles, visit Investor.fm and listen to the first episode of this podcast titled The Six Commandments of Value Investing. To learn more about how Vitaly's investment firm uses these principles to create low-risk, long-term oriented portfolios, visit imausa.com. Enjoy life and prosper.